welcome to my video. Okay, this painting is about painting something that's um, quite ordinary and trying to make it look extraordinary. And to do this, you need to experiment with light and shade and try and get us try and get it dynamic, even though the subject may be quite boring. Now, at the beginning, right at the beginning, you noticed that I had some paint on a plastic plate and that was just to show you how drippy to make the uh, paint. I like it uh, runny to start with because uh, that way I can get all kinds of textures into the paint. And here I'm I'm just putting down uh, the landscape part of the painting uh, using sap green and red ochre. You can use sap green and cadmium red or transparent oxide red or even burnt sienna and I the reason I do this is because I want texture now the color of the foreground won't necessarily end up exactly this color uh, it'll have variations in the tone and in fact later I'll be adding some other colors and I'll tell you what they are as I come to them so um, while this is going on um, I'll just answer a few questions that people have asked me. The type of oil that I use is made by a German company. Now I've looked on their website and I can't find the exact tin of the oil that I use. I get mine from a health food shop in France and I'm assuming that he buys it uh, wholesale, which I can't do or don't really want to do. Um, so you'll have to sort of scout around a bit. The name of the oil is Kreidezeit. Now, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but to spell it out, it's K-R-E-I-D-E-Z, or Z if you're an American, E-I-T, Kreidezeit. And uh, it contains a cicative, uh, which is the thing in the, in the oil that makes it dry quickly. And the paint that I use is made by a French company called Le Franc and Bourgeois. Very good colour, nice consistency. And um, I think the main reason I uh, use this paint, strangely enough, is because the sap green that they produce is, is dark. Some other manufacturers produce a green called sap green. And quite frankly, it's, uh, it's from another planet. It's not the same colour. So I like their product. The plywood that I use is just plywood bought from a hardware store. Um, it's about five millimeters thick, I think maybe less. Um, and I put three coats of gesso on it. I, I know I repeat stuff, but I think it's good to reinforce some of this information. Uh, the first thing I do with my plywood is I sand it um, with a fine sandpaper and I paint one coat of gesso. This will take approximately an hour to dry, depending on the local conditions. If it's a little bit humid, it'll take longer. Um, but one thing I will say is don't put your piece of plywood that you've gessoed on a radiator because it will warp. Just let it dry naturally at its own speed. So when the first coat is dry, I will sand it again, paint another coat of gesso, let that dry, and then put the final one on uh, without sanding. And that, by then, it's usually flat enough to paint on. The brushes that I use um, are mostly bought from hardware stores, although I do have some good brushes, and I get them from Jackson's Art Supplies of London. And there's a particular brush that I like, and it's called um, um, Black Hog, which I guess is uh, uh, hog bristle. And uh, they're excellent brushes. One of the few that I've found that doesn't seem to be suffering from alopecia. They do not go bald, so it's a good brush. So back to this painting. You'll notice that above the landscape at the bottom, I put in a lighter colour. Now that lighter colour is exactly the same colour as the bottom. It's just had a bit more white added to it. And then above that, which will be distant hills, it's the same colour again with a bit more blue added. And you can vary what, whatever you want to, uh, to achieve your sense of distance. The pale colour blue for the sky at the bottom is royal blue. One of my favourite colours, lovely colour. And then at the top, uh, phthalo blue. 
I will list all these in the info box underneath the video at the end. And uh, so now you can see that I, I'm not taking any care, just chucking the paint on and uh, just covering it up because these two colours will be blended together. And I'm not cleaning the brush. Um, uh, I, I give it a wipe every now and then, just with a paper towel, but uh, that's it. I don't use any thinners at all. And as soon as I've got all the loose paint off, if I want to blend, uh, I prefer to use quite a dry brush at this stage. Um, so that's what I'm probably doing now. I may have to edit this a bit more to get out some of these, uh, these blank spaces, because quite frankly, that's a little bit boring staring at that. Okay, so here I'm, I think I'm preparing, um, yes, there we are, my palette knife. This is, uh, this is something I've only recently started doing. What I would normally have done at the bottom of the painting, at the bottom of the sky, would be to uh, wipe off whatever colour I've put on the sky. Now, I'm just approaching this a little bit differently. Um, putting on tons of white paint. Oh, here's a little tip. When you paint a sky, one of the one of the things that you can do to a painting that will, that will tell people you are an amateur is to make the sky, make the clouds in the sky end before they come to the edge of the painting. You see, because uh, nature doesn't do that. Um, if you do that, you're painting something that will look unnatural. The, you're, you are taking a section of a landscape. You're not you're not pushing the landscape into the picture. You're just taking a section. So any clouds that come in your frame, um, frame meaning the area that you are painting, uh, the, those clouds will taper off the painting as well. So by doing that, you will, you will add more depth and more realism. So do not paint tidy little white clouds that fit conveniently into the picture. It just doesn't work. Okay, so now I've put some... Um, red ochre on the sky because I like I like I just like the effect really there's no deep and meaningful reason for this I just like the uh, I just like the color that it makes one of the worst things I've always thought when you when you're young and you go to school I don't think it happens so much now but when I went to school you know, you were taught that the leaves were green, the trunk was brown, the grass was green, the sky was blue, and the clouds were white. And that's possibly one of the best ways to stunt a child's artistic career, by implanting uh, that extremely useless information into someone's head. The sky can be any colour you like. It doesn't matter. And of course there's proof of that. Uh, if you look at anything in the 60s that's... Uh, got the name psychedelia attached to it although i i when i was in college i i took on board a lot of the technical stuff that uh, was taught to me but i i decided to you know use my imagination um if the tutors were telling me something that i just didn't agree with uh i was never argumentative i would listen to what they had to say and then um, filter out what i didn't really feel i wanted to know may sound a bit arrogant but um, I didn't want to I didn't want my paintings to be tainted by what they wanted I would rather do what I want so a bit of white on the sky and then a large wallpaper pasting brush just to get that extremely quick effect of uh, slightly dreamy wispy looking clouds when I do this uh, effect, uh, the brush is barely touching the canvas, uh, canvas, the board, uh, or indeed the paint. Um, I'm just skimming over the top, and then as soon as the brush looks as though it's picking up too much paint, I just wipe it off again with a paper towel. And you can see there, I take the cloud right off the edge of the picture. I don't know whether a great deal of thought goes into what I'm doing here. Uh, a lot of it is sort of instinctive and I just sort of go with the flow. Hmm. 
little reminder that uh, uh, you you also need perspective in a sky apart from the the land uh, by making the sky darker at the top you will get that effect um, of perspective it gives the feeling that the clouds are coming over your head instead of just being a, a flat backdrop conveniently dangling there above the horizon so again a few more swipes with the pasting brush so you can see how quickly you can achieve this effect right now this is my oval wash brush uh, I'm not I don't know I might not buy any more of these you can see I'm spending rather a lot of time on it getting off the loose hairs it seems to me that uh, when you first buy them they're not so bad but after about I don't know three or four paintings they decide to um, shed hair a little bit irritating because um, it's boring having to pick hair off your painting and again the same technique hardly touching the paint now this brush or these brushes will pick up more than the big pasting brush because the the um, the hair on the brush is much more finely packed so it's uh, it's offering more surface uh, area to the painting so you've really got to keep them as uh, not uh, I, I hesitate to use the word clean but dry it needs to be dry as, as dry as possible so again off the edge very important I will, I'll nag you about this very important take the marks off the edge of the picture much more natural so the same brush after a good wiping and I'm just going to go along the horizon just to get a bit more softness the more you do this the further away the horizon will appear to be and if you're painting a picture from your imagination try not to be too rigid about um, how can I put it well I I didn't I haven't established the final horizon all I've done here I'm, I'm making life difficult for myself I've got several straight lines going across the picture and what I'm doing is um, if you look back on some of my other videos I talk about stoppers and stoppers are objects that you put in a painting to prevent the viewer's eye shooting off to the left or right so I've I'm, I'm really I'm sort of pushing myself here to make it difficult for myself there are no stoppers at the edge either edge of this painting what I'm trying to do is get the attention focused actually on the line uh, which will appear a line of trees which will appear soon I want the attention to be on them but I want it to be so contrasty and as interesting as I can make it so that the eye goes back and forth up and down up and down and uh, you let me know if you think it works it seems to be quite a popular painting uh, on Facebook so uh, we'll see so I'm fuzzing up the edge here just a little bit no detail ah now okay so detail now it may look as though I'm adding detail later um, but I'm not I'm just doing the impression or the illusion of detail on the trees and you'll see that soon so just fuzzing up the edge interesting stuff uh, grass and foliage it's quite deceptive and you really have to learn how to look carefully but if you have a, a ridge line which this will appear as soon um, it's never absolutely crisp it's always got twigs and branches that are sticking up and over a distance that will give the appearance of it looking fuzzy if you really look into it and see it some people miss this and they'll just paint a hard line and put a line of trees on it with no relation between one color and one tone or one surface and the next they just do a hard line don't do hard lines try and keep your lines reasonably soft but not too soft if you go too soft then you start to paint fog and uh, that's not what I'm after here I'll probably do some fog paintings 
later. So I've just wiped the colour now, just to get a little streak of light on the land. If I left it just flat green, it would be tedious, and uh, we don't want tedious. And using uh, all my skills to keep my shoulder out of the way, <laughs> all my skills to texture up the foreground. Um, so I'm using a paper towel, scrunching it up into a ball, making all kinds of bumps on it so that it uh, picks up the paint. If you use it flat, you'll just wipe paint away. If you make it sort of bumpy, it'll take some paint and leave uh, the old dark spot, which is essential. And then I'm digging into the paint a little bit harder because I know that later I'll be adding another colour to this part that I'm wiping away. And I want it to accept the new colour that I put on top. By wiping away, the new colour will be clean. If I don't wipe it away and I put colour on top, they'll mix together and you'll get mud. Now the fun part. Okay, a bit of whipping. So I've screwed the paper into a sort of taper and basically knocking the heck out of it uh, just to get random shapes of foliage. Now this is again the same colour as the distant hills but just with a little bit more blue added to give these uh, distant trees a little bit of contrast. This is one of the um, Jackson's brushes, the Black Hog. Excellent brush. I've had these for a few years now. And, um, I, I don't actually ever remember a hair coming out of one of them. Unless, of course, I'm getting too old and doddery and I'm not noticing. But it, they're just really good brushes. Um, also, I should say this too. This is, this is important. All these products that I recommend, I'm not paid to recommend them. I'm just doing it because uh, I like them. Now I'm at the stage where it's easy to get bogged down with detail, so I'm just dabbing away here with zero precision, just putting in tonal changes. You'll see very little of what I'm doing because the line of trees that will be sitting on that uh, dark ridge will obscure most of them. The reason I do this is so that any bits that I miss between the trees you will already have the background painting and I won't have to sort of tediously try and fit it in between the trees. So it's, I'm, I'm just doing this for um, just for an impression really. I'll be going back to the sky later. I've I'm one of these people who, um, well, I don't know how to explain it. I, I just never feel that my skies are completely finished. I think it's because I enjoy actually just pushing paint around. Uh, and, of course, skies are the perfect subject for that sort of thing. While you're watching this, I must tell you a little story. This is quite interesting. Now, for people who... Um, who want to make money out of their paintings. This is something I did when I was a student. Uh, when I went to college, which was, feels like centuries ago, um, I had a student grant, which was not a lot of money. Uh, back in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, it was £60 per term, which I guess, I think you Americans would call it a semester, but we call it terms. I don't know whether we still do, but anyway. Um, it wasn't a lot of money, and for that I had to buy all my paint, no, um, paper, and everything, really. And um, So what I used to do in summer holidays was I would walk around, um, or cycle sometimes, uh, around the town that I lived in, and outside the town, obviously, 
and find a really nice looking house where it looks as though the people have money. And then I would set myself up in a lane just near the house and paint the landscape with the house obviously in the painting. And I would choose my spot so that it was a, um, the route that they would take if they were going shopping. And it worked. They would. Uh, I, I sold eight, eight paintings, I think it was, in my time at college, um, for around twenty pounds a painting, which in those days was actually not too bad. That was like uh, half a week's wages, and um, so I would make sure that I was seen sitting there painting this view with their house in it, and these people would uh, slow down as they went by and. Uh, I'd make sure that the picture was positioned so they could see it. And uh, then, sure as, as they say, sure as eggs is eggs, uh, these people would turn up, nonchalantly walking down the lane, just to have a look, see what I was doing, and um, they bought my paintings. So it was a good way to supplement my, um, my grant. Now, here, I... You'll see a slight change of mind in a minute. Um, I started painting the trees and I realised that the paint was a little bit too thick. So, you know, one of the things I always say to people is you mustn't get, um, you mustn't have any fear. If you feel you make a mistake uh, or something, not necessarily a mistake, just a change of mind. If you, if you come across this uh, sort of situation, this, this is what palette knives are for. If you have too much paint on there and you feel that uh, you, you, you can't cover it with a brush, either scrape off or use a palette knife because the palette knife will apply the paint which will sit on top of the colour. As long as you don't use it too heavily, use it with quite a light touch. Now here, I, I, I from what I can remember of the painting, I continue al along this tree line and then I, I um, decide the paint is just too thick. I need, I need more contrast. So I will probably scrape it off. And it, oh, the tree line. Okay, so here we are, a bit of scraping. Uh, the tree line. Um, the painting has the appearance of being backlit. In other words, the bottom part of the sky is my main source of light. So these trees would look dark against the, um, the light background. And um, I wanted maximum contrast, and I didn't feel I was getting it. So I, this is uh, why I do the scraping. And the, the trees, I don't use any kind of reference for this. I have no photograph to look at. Uh, this is probably something, some place that I've seen in the past. I really can't remember. But I've always been sort of vaguely fascinated by lines of trees. And uh, I guess it's because the, the changes from light to dark. And I just find trees a little bit majestic anyway. And the paint that I use is made by a French company. These brushes also, by the way, are... Uh, perfect for the for this sort of tree. Um, I'm not going to paint every branch and every twig. I never do. The only the only well, I, the only detail I add to these trees is a little bit of highlighting on the top edge, um, and a few tree trunks that I accentuate later on. The shape as I work my way across is just totally random. Don't. Don't really, I don't really think about it, actually. But I think that possibly comes from painting so many trees. So while you're watching this, which is a little bit boring, um, I'll just tell you something about basic drawing skills. When I was at college, I could never really understand um, why this repetition that we had to go through of, of drawing people and occasionally objects for instance um, for a long time I thought that the tutors in the college were sadists because um, one particular teacher he uh, 
He came into the studio one morning, big studio, lovely building. Um, and he, he just put a bicycle on the floor, just laid it down and said, right, draw that. So we all sat around meticulously drawing a bicycle. And a bicycle laying down on the floor from any position, doesn't matter where you are, it's not easy. So we did this. And he came back, a, I don't know, about an hour and a half later, and he had a chair, a wooden chair. So he put that on top of the bicycle. He said, now add that. So everybody muttered. So uh, we started drawing this chair on top of a bicycle. He left us a little bit longer. And then he appeared with another five or six chairs and piled them up in the middle of the floor on top of the bicycle. This wasn't a functioning bicycle, by the way. This was just the... This was the model bike to torment the students. So we ended up with a bicycle almost being crushed by a great pile of wooden chairs. He said, right, now draw that lot. So we did this, and not, e not at all easy. My goodness, it was difficult. Then he said, right, OK, just uh, leave all your drawings and I'll look at them overnight and uh, report back tomorrow. So that we're all wondering... You know what's going to happen? Are we are we going to be praised or, or are we going to be um, uh, criticised? So the next day, we went into college, and uh, same studio, same teacher, and he had a pile of chairs and a bicycle on top. He said, "Now draw this and draw the negative shapes. Don't draw the bicycle or the chairs. Draw the shapes in between them." So we did this. Quite boring. It, it it focused your mind, but incredibly boring. But it did actually teach you a few things about drawing skills and how you just have to persevere and get on with it. And um, so the upshot of this story is that when I left college, I worked for a design studio in Brighton in England, which is on the south coast of England. And um, I remember one of my first jobs uh, that was dropped on me a client wanted a picture of a man and a woman in Edwardian clothing with a flat-bottomed boat called a punt uh, moored at the edge of the river. The man was to be helping the woman out of the punt by offering her hand. And on the grass in the foreground was to be a hamper full of goodies. There had to be a tree over to the right-hand side and as the tree was overhanging the river up in the up in the branches of the tree there had to be a squirrel which was eating a nut and generally doing what squirrels do so you have to bear in mind this is in the days when there was no internet there was no reference for me to use no book no pic, no books with pictures and um his last words to me before he went home for the night was I'm sure you'll do a good job, Stuart. See you in the morning. Can you have it done? And Oh, by the way, it needs to be pen and ink. And uh, stressful, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. But I was so pleased that I'd actually uh, managed to get a job in a proper design studio. I stuck at it. And all of my skills that I'd learned at college suddenly started to come back. How to draw a person in this position. Out. Trees, no problem. No, absolutely no problem Problem with the trees. The boat was a little bit of a challenge because boats in perspective are quite difficult, but I managed it. And the client was pleased. And uh, the, I suppose the, the moral of the story is whatever you're doing, um, practice. Practice makes perfect. Just keep at it. And there may be times when you feel that you just want to give it up and take up sculpture or something else. But you know, keep at it, eventually it pays off. You have to be single-minded and focused. So now you can see the trees on here are getting a little bit more interesting. Um, I'm just emphasising a little bit of light on the field behind. And for this I'm using light green, which comes in a tube and it's just called light green. And I've added a little bit of lemon yellow. Not too much. I always, I, well, always, I have this theory that as grass recedes away from you, the green that you have in the grass, um, it's better if it contains more white. 
if you just add yellow, you will end up with a, a field that is a yellow plant, not grass. And I'm, I'm trying to keep this grassy. Um, although I do want a little bit of this sort of intense light coming through, so that's why I've added a bit of yellow. Yellow is not a colour I use often. And I'm this is quite a small brush for me. I, I tend to try to stick to large brushes. And I'm, I'm basically just scumbling in the shape, uh, the colour rather, and avoiding hard lines as much as possible. And put the odd unpredictable little bump sticking up too. Nature does that. And the, the downward lines that you can see are mostly just from the edge of the brush contacting the, um, the large brush, but the, the large brush contacting the picture. So it gives you automatic tree trunks. So this is just going to continue right along until I get to the end of the line. And then um, something else would happen. Uh, the reason I say this is because I'm doing my commentary as usual, watching my video editor work through. I'm a bit late uploading this. The, um, the internet went down yesterday. Funny how these things happen. The internet went down and the central heating stopped working. It was like going back to the Middle Ages. I'm trying to think if there are any more questions I need to answer. I, I often get asked the same question many times. Um, just as a reminder, I guess um, the oil that I add to the paint um, is mixed to roughly the same consistency as maple syrup. Um, if you mix it together and you, or whatever palette you're using, I, I'm using up some um, plastic plates which soon will not be on sale in France. They banned them and uh, I think they're allowing the supermarkets just to sell off the final few. But um, whatever you're mixing your paint on, when you mix up the sap green and the red ochre to the right consistency, it should slowly drip, very slowly. Not a fast drip, a slow drip, if you can visualise that. And so there's a, there's a close-up of the trees. Um, and what I'm going to be doing here now is just adding... This is, this is almost sap green straight from the tube. Quite a subtle shadow underneath uh, the surface of the branches. I, I think of trees like this as in a, a mass. So you've got a mass of one green, which is like reasonably neutral. Although on here it looks a bit dark, but uh, I think the final picture will reveal all. And then I'm just darkening the bits underneath to give the feeling of roundness to the painting. So, and again, it's I'm, I'm trying not to be too fiddly. Can't bear fiddly pictures. So, you know, keeping it as loose as possible. And there we are, kicking the um, easel. Sorry about that. So the bottom, the bottom edges. Um, if you if you get this kind of randomness in your painting, uh, it will add a bit of life to the picture. Try try to get into the habit of not for this style. I must emphasise for this style. This is not photorealism by any any means. This is this is um, impressionism, basically. Uh, with, uh, on the well, impressionism on the edge of tonalism. So, any stroke that you make on the picture, keep it lively and try and keep it so that it appears as if you've only touched the paint once. That way, of course, you will avoid mud. So, as you can see here, down the down the edge here, I'm keeping the the brush fidgeting around, occasionally picking up a bit of the yellow, and pushing it up into the green.
as usual I'm sitting here watching wondering what's going to happen next who knows okay so um, back to the shadows I don't know what sort of tree this is but uh, I've seen it somewhere could be hawthorn I think um, in America you have cotton trees which are similar to this, sort of flat topped. Okay, a random little jump in the hedge line there, just to spark a bit of interest. This paint uh, that I'm for the shadows is pretty well out of the tube. I might have added just a tiny bit of oil to it, but. Um, it's it's reasonably stiff. Now then, a little bit of light green. This is um, I, I use the term loosely. It's called light green. It's not green that I have made light. Um, well, no, I'm telling a lie. I have made it slightly light because I've added a bit of white to it, but it, um, it's a very useful all-purpose sort of colour for landscapes. If you look at any paintings by Constable, you'll notice um, that his, his grass, as it gets further away, is, is a, a, what I call a white green. So now I'm going to um, start putting a bit of highlighting along the top edge of these trees soon. But apparently not yet. Um, here I'm just putting in, obviously, a little bit of an impression of uh, distant bushes and stuff. Again, no, no real thought. So long as, as long as the dots of colour recede uh, reasonably well, I'm, I'm sort of happy. What I could have done at the beginning for this is some. Um, if I'd planned it more, I could have put all that, that stuff in the background there, right across the picture, and then just obliterated the bits I didn't want, but I, I uh, decided not to for this one. Okay, a little bit of light catching the top of these trees. This is an effect I've always liked. I don't know why, it just sort of appeals to me. And again, keep it as random as possible. It's one of my favourite sayings, actually. Nature does that. While you're watching this, I'll just mention um, a few things. Uh, this year has been quite amazing, and it's thanks to all you people who are watching my videos. Um, my video that I uploaded about six weeks ago called The Illusion of Detail, or Painting the Illusion of Detail, um, went viral and it's just under half a million views. And I think it's mainly because of that that I've, I, my year is completely almost full of people coming here to France for my five day course. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's gone quite staggered by the response. Uh, I'm very pleased, so thank you if you're one of the people who um, either is coming or um, at least viewed my video. I, I'm um, quite overwhelmed, really. There's one month, maybe two months. Well, August is pretty busy. I've got, uh, I've got one, two, three, We've got five people coming in August alone. June has got two people. 
May has got three people. April has got two, three people. March, um, well, obviously it's March now. I think uh, I've got a little bit of space between now and the 1st of April when someone is coming for five days. And uh, if you're interested in doing this, um, contact me through Facebook. There may be some spaces later in the year. I know that November um, is okay. There's still a couple in there. I'm keeping September and October as free as possible because I will need a break. Um, and um, yeah, November, I've definitely got one person. I could I could accommodate two more at a push. And even December. So if you're not doing anything in December and you want to go to France, um, you can find me on Facebook. So if you just look for Stuart Davis Artist and send me a message, I will send you my info sheet. This year, my prices are staying the same um, all, all through the year. I was going to raise them, but I'm not. Um, it's £500 for five days. Uh, Next year, it's going up a little bit um, because, they, well, prices rise and uh, costs of paint and board and all kinds of stuff goes up a little bit. Uh, but next year, if you come, um, not only do you learn painting, but you go away with a free painting painted by me. I've always believed that uh, when things are going well, you should always give back a bit. So that's what I'm going to do. So um, that's what you get. And it will be probably, I don't know what it is in inches, but in centimetres, it would probably be 60 by uh, 80 centimetres. And it could be a painting exactly like this or whatever sort of subject you want. Well, no, hang on, correction there. The subject will always be landscape. And I try to avoid... Um, putting in any man-made objects. You know, I even resist the temptation to put a few fence posts in because I just like raw nature, frankly. So, um, yeah, if you want a painting that looks like this, I can do this while you while I am teaching you. And um, you get a free, a free Davis. So there's a, a slightly more panoramic view. That little bit of light on the top of the trees is working quite well. I'm pleased with that. Uh, it just brings the trees just, well, just a bit, a lot forward of the mountains in the background. The foreground is going to be challenging. And um, I looked at it long and hard and I decided that I like all the texture in the foreground and I like the light spot at the bottom. Um, but I, I will soon be adding a sort of hint of a bluish cast on the grass. I don't know why I did it. Quite often I, I don't know why I do certain things in paintings, but it just seemed to, to need it. I was driving the other day and I was looking at a field of grass and the light was catching it in a certain way and it had a sort of blue sheen to it. So I thought, well, why not? Let's do it. What's the worst thing that can happen? Not a lot, really. It's just a painting. Paint without fear. If it goes wrong, wipe it off. Now, there has been a little bit of a break. And, uh, this is important. Um, this is not all painted in one go. I did have a break um, because um, I had to do some of my other work. Uh, plus the internet went down, uh, which slowed me down on some other things. So I, I, I left the painting and it dried off a bit. So the foreground, um, because of the sicative that's in the oil, dried reasonably quickly. So anything I'm doing on the foreground now, um, is there's not much chance of me creating a, any mud because uh, I'm just painting on dry paint. And it, it's only... I don't know, 15 to 20 hours before you can do this, as long as you don't paint thickly. And I was pleased with the texture, particularly the down on the right-hand side at the bottom, that dark area, 
that adding things like that to a painting will pull the foreground into the foreground. And um, I guess, yeah, now going back to right at the beginning, when I was talking about stoppers, you notice that the um, light behind the trees is slightly more intense at the middle of the painting. As you go over to the right hand side, if you follow that tree, tree line along, there's less contrast. Now, that is, I guess, my stopper. That's the thing that is pulling the eye back to the middle. And by putting those few random shapes of distant bushes in the biggest gap between the trees, um, right in the middle there, that also pulls the eye back. So what I'm hoping when people look at this picture is that the first thing they will see is that contrast behind the trees. The second thing they will look at, I hope, is the sky, and I, I, because I love skies. And the next thing I, is that they will go down the bottom. Oh, there's me adding that slightly blue grass there. Uh, because it's dark at the bottom, that pulls the foreground up and that gives the appearance of the, the feeling that you can walk into the painting. It puts the bottom of the painting under your feet. And that light spot in the middle, I hope, subtly leads you up again to that middle section of the painting. Now, um, often I would paint with quite a large brush, uh, this, this thing I'm doing now with the adding the blue, but didn't really feel necessary. If the paint was wet, I probably would have used a bigger brush, but as it's dried off, it didn't seem to matter. I could just sort of actually quite loosely put colour on without worrying about mud. So back to the sky. Always my favourite bit. A few highlights, just to sort of, again, just to emphasise where the light is coming from. And the sky has so much paint on it, it is not dry. Um, it's quite sticky. So I need to be a little bit careful that I don't get too carried away and, um, and also muddied up. So few little spots of white and then I'll go back to it with a blending brush very quickly and as you can see it's not the big brush it's back to the um, oval wash which is a cultura brush uh, and I will be looking for alternatives. So not spending any great time on this. I'm just uh, just skimming the edges of the clouds. I quite like paintings that have the effect of a horizon that is slightly vague. Um, I've sort of always, I don't know, I've, it fascinates me. It's, it's a little bit of mystery in the landscape. You know, is that, is that a distant hill or, or is it mist or what? So it's just a little something to tease the viewer's eye. Again, um, one one way to that I teach is repetition. Um, so I'll do it on this video. Don't forget, take the clouds right off the edge of the painting. I've added also um, up in the sky a tiny bit of Payne's grey. Uh, it seems to be the colour that is almost designed for dark clouds or the shadows that you get under clouds. And by keeping your brush strokes reasonably free um, and sporadic, 
you will get the effect of movement in the sky. It needs to, it needs to look as though it's blowing through your painting. Now here I'm just putting in a little bit more um, red ochre to the clouds, just to warm them up a little bit. Uh, I do get people still saying, why do you put brown in the sky? Well, maybe it's just me, I don't know, I see, I see brown. Um, if I painted all the colours I see in the sky, you'd probably laugh, but uh, maybe I have a fault with my eyes, I don't know. But anyway, I like, I like a little bit of brown. And uh, you, as you see there, I'm flicking hairs off the painting. Continuing with the blending. You don't have to add brown, by the way, you can use some. If you want to warm your skies up, you could put a sort of, um, well, I suppose a bit of purple would have the same effect. You could put orange, uh, any, any of the warm colours, you know, anything that doesn't contain blue is a warm colour, frankly. Some are more neutral than others, but uh, that's, that's obvious. I decided some of the brush strokes needed re-establishing. That's why I'm wiping the picture now with a um, paper towel. I just wanted to sort of simplify it a little bit in a few places. So sort of slightly back to basics. And then a little bit more Payne's Grey at the top. I wish I could understand sometimes uh, what it is about stormy skies. I mentioned this in, I think, my last video, but I'm sort of drawn to um, storms. I totally understand these people. Um, I, I've seen videos of these people in America called storm chasers. Um, I can totally understand why they do it, um, even, even though it's probably incredibly dangerous. It's something I would wouldn't mind trying just for the experience but uh, it's just this the feeling of power that you can have uh, in a sky a sky on, in a painting can make or break it if you you know if you just have a flat sky in some cases it can work very well if you want to convey a certain mood um, it's just that I, I just love storms So here we are, we're coming to the end of this video. I hope you've, I hope you've learned something and um, please feel free to comment. I read all comments and I will acknowledge them. Ask any questions you like. If I don't know the answer, as usual, I'll tell you that I don't know the answer. And um, the next video is going to be me finishing off a few paintings from my last few videos. There's a seascape probably a stormy sky, sounds like me anyway, and a sort of dried riverbed which I'm going to add some water to because I know that some people do have a bit of trouble with water. So I'll see you on the next video. Oh, and uh, before you go, or before I go, uh, if you like this, please subscribe. Um, there's a bell button, I think, next to the subscribe button. So if you click on that, you'll be informed when I upload my next video. Uh, offering and what else yes um, there's I'll be putting a load of other information in the box below this video I have a patreon page I think everybody knows what that's for um, again if you want to come and learn here it's probably going to be for next year now but the, the, as I said earlier there are spaces this year but l much later in the year and um, there we are Here's a bit of music, and I hope you like the finished painting. See you soon. Bye.